thing tonight. I want to try to just mind the Lord and preach a little thought here and, uh, and get out of the way. But Acts chapter 17, verse 1. If you're there, say amen. 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 It says, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollyana, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews, and, his, and Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas of the devout Greeks a great mul- and of the devout Greeks a great multitude and of the chief women not a few. But the Jews which believed not moved with envy took unto them a certain lewd fellows of the baser sort and gathered a company and set all the city in an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren under the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we love you tonight. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the good singing tonight. Thank you, Lord, for what we felt in our heart. God, I thank you, Lord, for the worship, Lord, you let us take part in. And Lord, you have been so good to us. Thank you for the blood, God. I thank you, Lord, for washing away my sins. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Thank you for Calvary, Lord. Thank you for your your Bible that we get to read tonight. And Lord, thank you for this church. Lord, I ask you tonight one more time that you touch me, Lord. Please help me, God. Guide my thoughts and my words tonight. Let me say only what you want. And Lord, I pray that you'd use me tonight. Let me be a vessel for you, Lord. We ask you, Lord, and we'll give you all the praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm interested in one little phrase right here in the end of verse 6. It says, these that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. I got there studying that and looking at that the other day, and the Lord just sort of brought that to my mind and wouldn't let me get away from it. And I looked up what it was to... To, to turn upside down, and, and it means to trouble. It means to confuse, and it means to disturb. And, and that's exactly what happened. Everywhere Paul went, and everywhere uh, it was Paul here, and, and Silas and Timotheus, or Timothy, that was here, that these three that was here in this, this group, and everywhere they went, that was their testimony that they turned the world upside down. That's what the lost world was saying about these men. They said everywhere they go, they trouble, and they, they, they just turn things upside down down and that's exactly what the gospel ought to do and that's exactly what missions ought to do. Uh, do you remember where, where it was where you was and, and when God turned your world upside down I remember well where I was preacher and, and where I was January 31st 2004 when the preacher got up and preached uh, actually the day before on the second coming of Christ and, and boy it turned my world upside down. I went home that night I couldn't sleep I couldn't eat you know what it was God had done stir some things in my heart I was fearful I was afraid. You know, my world had gotten turned upside down. It disturbed me. And friend, I'm glad for the day that I got disturbed. Amen. But that's what it was with Paul and Silas. Uh, as we look here, I want to just mention a few things. Uh, uh, this this, this, this uh, book of Acts is a, is a history book. It's a history of the works uh, of what God did in the early years of the church there. It's a history book. That's what it is. It's a missions book. It gives us an outline for missions and, 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 a, and a path that we can follow. But we don't get a doctrine from the book of Acts. There's many things that was done in the book of Acts that was a one-time deal. That's not going to be repeated. The day of Pentecost is not going to be repeated again. Friend, that's, that's, that's not going to happen. I don't care what the Pentecostals do and they talk about the second blessing and all that. Friend, if all they've ever had is a second blessing, they've missed out. Friend, I've got a whole lot more than a second blessing. I'm already up in the hundreds. I mean, God's a blessing me every day but to thank God for it but you see we don't get our doctrine from there but there's many lessons many spiritual lessons and and many miracles and many acts here all through the book of Acts that we can take and, and draw an application from and learn lessons from Throughout the book of Acts, there's many lessons when it comes to missions as we look here. We see the mandate of missions as you look here. But, uh, Acts chapter 1 verse 8, he told, Jesus told his disciples, he said, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and in other most parts of the world. That, that was a mandate. Jesus said, he said, there's coming today. He said, when that power comes on, that's when you're to be a witness. That was in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts chapter 2, that's when the power came on them. 
The day of Pentecost, that's when the Holy Spirit came down and He filled the church. Uh, uh, friend, and, and all of us that are saved after that, friend, that happens the very moment you get saved. Friend, the Holy Ghost came into my life and filled me the day I got saved. Amen. You see, that's the way it works now. But you see, that was, that was a mandate. Jesus said, you tarry here. And when that comes, he said, yeah, then you're to be witnesses. Then you shall be witnesses both unto me, Jerusalem. That's the mandate of missions. But as you look in the book of Acts, chapter 1 through 7, we see the mistakes of missions. We can see a mistake right there. And I still remember Brother Stinney preached on the First Baptist Church of Jerusalem. And he preached on that church. You know, that was the first mega church ever was. It, it wasn't right to be a mega church. Amen. It wasn't right. You see, but uh, you think about this. On the day of Pentecost, the Bible said there was 3,000 saved. You go over another chapter, there was 5,000 saved. And it was just men. That was just men right there. Not counting the ladies. Can you see the thousands of people now? Here was a mega church that was being formed. But you never see one time that they carry that gospel to the uttermost parts. They're staying right there. That's, that was their mistake. They did not obey Acts chapter 8, verse, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. We see them even trying to do a socialism experience. Now we see them there taking what they had and selling it. They had everything in common. That never was God's plan. But you see, we have an Acts 8 1 because they did not obey Acts 1 8. Acts 1 8 says, you're to, you're to go in all the world, you shall be a witness uh, into uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and other most parts of the world. Because they didn't obey Acts 1, God gave them an Acts 8. Because they didn't obey Acts 1 8, God gave them an Acts 8 1. Said, because of the persecution of Stephen. Said, they were scattered everywhere preaching the word of God. They didn't do what God told them to do, so God said, I'll make you go. And that's exactly what happened. So we see the mistakes of mission. And boy, you can spend time on that and look at that there. Uh, but, but we see that, but we see the, the might of missions from Acts chapter 8 all the way to today. You see, I still believe God's still recording, amen. The book of Acts is finished. But you see the, the works of the Holy Spirit, which is what the Acts records is the work of the Holy Spirit, is still going on today. God's still working today. God's still working in this church. Hey, we experienced it just now as they were singing. Boy, you could feel the, the Spirit of God working and moving in hearts. He's still working around this world. Friend, you see the, the might of missions is still going on, and it's going to go on until Jesus comes back. You see the might of missions, and you can see you can see as they went in and, and how God stirred his soul saved through that. We see the might of missions. We see the manner of missions. And, and you could go on and on and on through the book of Acts here. But I want to look here at this, at these verses here for just a minute. And I want to look at some things about Paul and Silas and, and Timothy here. As we look here, I want to know some things about them. I noticed number one, their tenacity. Look at verse 1. It says, Now when they had passed through Amphi Amphipolis, or uh, ever how you pronounce that, and Apollyon, they came to Thessalonica, where it was the synagogue of the Jews. I want to say their tenacity. They passed, they passed through. They kept going. They didn't stop. Yeah. That tenacity, their determination. Do you know what all of these men had already faced at this point in time? At Lystra, they had, Paul had already been stoned to death at, at Lystra. You see at Philippi, in the chapter before, chapter 16, they was, they was called and they was beaten and thrown in prison. But they didn't stop there. The Bible said they passed on. They kept going. The tenacity, these men didn't stop. You see, they, they just kept passing on. And friend, they didn't let these things stop them, friend. There'll be things in, the, in our life that we will encounter. Uh, we'll, we'll encounter obstinate people. We'll encounter obstacles in our life. We're going to encounter opposition, friend. But we need to have some tenacity like Paul and Silas and Timothy that would just keep going on anyway. No matter what happens. No matter what people lie about us. No matter what kind of struggles we face. No matter what kind of problems we face. Just go ahead and set our face like a flint like Jesus did. And and follow, and follow on and keep going on the tenacity of these men. It was later on in Paul's life where he said in, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he said, I have fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. I've finished my course. And you see, he, was, he did not quit. He had a determination to press on. God give us some people that were that kind of determination. I want to have that kind of determination in my life. I want to have it in my ministry. We see their tenacity, but we see the truth they share, verses 2 and 3. Paul said, as his matter was, he went in unto them and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. 
You see, and verse 3 tells us what he was reasoning, opening a legend that Christ must needs have suffered and risen from again from the dead and that this same Jesus I preach unto you is Christ. We see the truth that they shared. It was Bible truth. Every word, Paul said, in a, it, Paul said in another place in the charge in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says, Timothy, preach the word. Friend, you know what the truth there was that they shared was the truth of God's word. It was the gospel. It was the good news that Jesus saves. Friend, we're not to hold this truth, but the Bible says we're to share this truth. You know what that truth will do? And you know what I found that that truth will do? It will convict. If we preach that truth, it will convict. You know what it will do? It will convert. You know what else it'll do? It'll change. It, it'll, it'll change some people. It'll call some people. I, I've seen God work and I've seen it work there. You see the truth that they shared. There's the truth that we've got to remember. We've got to remember, uh, friend, who we are. We're, ch we're children of it. Uh, John said in John 3, 1, 1 John 3, 1, he said, Beloved, now are you the sons of God. We need to remember who we are. We need to remember uh, ourselves how we got in this way. It was by his mercy by His grace, it, it's not that we deserved anything because we didn't deserve anything. But when you think about that, when we, when we look at people, and, and I, it may just be me, but I struggle with it. We work around a lot of Muslims. I don't know about you, but I didn't know how prejudiced and how racist I was toward them until I got around them. You see, but what, we need to remember it was only by the mercy and grace. Just as they don't deserve it, I didn't deserve it neither. I deserved hell. I deserved to go. Just because I was born in Alabama and I was born to some good parents and raised me in church and taught me what was right, I didn't deserve salvation any more than they did. The truth is I need to remember where I come from, how I got in this way. And I need to remember, I need to remember the truth of what God has given me is that we're to show forth the praises of him that had called us from darkness unto life. We need to remember the truth that that's what God wants us to do. That's the truth that they shared, their tenacity. We see the triumph of the gospel. Look at verse 4. It said, And some of them believed, and consorted with Paul and Silas of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, chief women, not a few. That word consort means to bring into fellowship. You know, that's what God will do. That's what the gospel will do. The gospel will bring you into fellowship. It will bring you into the family of God. You see the, the triumph of the gospel. As you look at verse 4, we see the triumph of the gospel. It triumphs over all barriers. There's not a barrier that the gospel can't triumph over. We see religious barriers right here. It says some of them, he was talking about the Jews. You know the gospel can triumph over religious barriers. It can reach those that are religious. Friend, but not only that, it can reach the, the racial barriers. And it says of the devout Greeks. It'll triumph over that. It'll triumph over rich and poor barriers. It'll triumph over that. It'll triumph over cultural barriers. Uh, said of the chief women, not a few. In that time, there was a cultural thing. Many times the women didn't have the rights and all that they had, but that gospel triumphed over all those barriers. We see the triumph of the gospel here. And friend, the gospel will still triumph today if we'll share it. Amen. It's still triumphant. Well, we see the twisted crowd in verse 5. I'm getting out here. I want, to, I want to bring just one little thought out tonight. But we see the twisted crowd in verse 5. It says, but the Jews which believe not move with envy. Whenever the Lord is working, you can mark her down, that the devil's going to butt in. That's exactly what he had here. You see here it was in verse 4, the gospel had triumphed over all these barriers. There was Jews getting saved. There was, there was Greeks getting saved. Women was getting saved. The rich and the poor was getting saved. God was doing a work. And in verse 5, God was working in verse 4. In verse 5, the devil butts in. You see, that's what he'll always do. Boy, I would love to have one, uh, just one year or one term or, or something where the devil would not give us some kind of trouble. What an honor it would be. But you know what? Many times it's a good thing because as long as he's a fighting against us, I know I'm probably doing right. Amen. You see, when, when everything, if everything was to go right, I wouldn't have a problem. I ought to be worried then because I'm probably not doing something right. Friend, because if the devil's not fighting it, friend, God's probably not in it. But we see the devil, that's what he'll do. He'll butt in. And look what he did. And the devil used many different things. He used that religious crowd right here. It says the Jews which believed not. Here was some of the most religious people on the planet, and, and, they, and, and they began to move within me. You know who our biggest opposition is in Uganda? It's some of the people that are closest to what we believe. 
The Church of Uganda, boy, they sang our hymns. They, they sing our hymns and they believe almost like we do all the way down and they'll say they believe salvation like we do until they go to add and work sin. You see, but there's some of our biggest obstacles there. They'll fight us from political fighting to, to different means there. You see, the Pentecostals will fight us. It's not the lost crowd. It's not even the Muslims. We don't have trouble with the Muslims that much. Some of our greatest church members are people that was of the Muslim faith that got saved. Boy, if you ever see a Muslim get saved, they'll make the ch best church member. You ain't got to beat all that garbage out of them that the Pentecostals had put in them. Boy, they don't know anything. Boy, they get saved and they're right in there. They're like a sponge. We'll soak it up. But some of our worst, our, our worst opposition is religious. But that's what the devil will use. He'll use that envy. It said that they move with envy. You know what? If, we, if what I've seen in the ministry... One of the most disheartening things, preacher, in the ministry is envy. I seen that on the mission field with missionaries. I saw it when I pastored, when I was in, in, in church. You'll, you'll see one church when God begins to bless in them. And they're doing it right, by the way. And boy, somebody would get envious. You see, and this one's over here. God's blessing this one and somebody will get jealous or envious. God help us not to let immaturity in our Christian life get to the point where the devil can use our envy to cause opposition for somebody else. We see that. But we see the envious. We see the wicked crowd. He said they gathered together certain lewd. That, that word lewd means wicked. That's what they was doing. Here was folks that hated Christ, hated godliness, hated, hated, hated religion. And they gathered them together, the wicked crowd. Then he got the confused crowd. They just gathered a whole crowd together that did not know why they was opposing and they just knew that the, everybody else was. You know, we have a lot of that going on today. There's a lot of people going to church. They, they, they'll go to these big mega churches. They, they ain't got a clue what they believe or anything else. They're just going there because that's where everybody's going. There's a, we, we, have a, we have a lot today in our churches that have no discernment. They have, they, have no, they have no judgment about them. They, they think the only verse in the Bible is judge not that you be not judged. God help us today. My Bible tells me we're to judge some things. We need to have some discernment in this day and time. Friend, but you see the devil will use all these things as opposition. And, and, and when he begin, when the Lord begins to work and he begins to stir, the devil will use these means to, to butt in to try to stop the work of God. We see the twisted crowd. We see the testimony of these three men. Verse, look at verse 6. And notice it was, it was well, a testimony. It, your testimony is not what you say when the pastor calls for, hey, when you stand up and, and you're going to testify. That's not your actual testimony. Your testimony is what others think of you, what they see out of your life. That's what your testimony is. If you want to know my testimony, you go and ask the folks around my family. You go to ask some folks where I go to church. You go over to Uganda and you ask the folks of Njeru there, say, well, what about Masumba Knowles? What about Pastor Knowles? They'll tell you what kind of testimony I have. You see, and that, that was these people's testimony. It was the people from the outside, what they said about it. I want to ask you this, what is our testimony? What kind of testimony do we have? The Bible said of Enoch that he had this testimony that he pleased God. What kind of testimony do we have? Every place these people went, everywhere Paul and Silas and, and Timothy went, you see, there was, was either a riot or a revival. People either, either believed or they bore stones going to throw at them. You see, everywhere they went, that's the way it was. There was people that was delivered or, 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 or they, was, they was wanting to be uh, thrown out of town or people was divided over. That was their testimony. But their testimony was this, that these people have come to us, these that have turned the world upside down. That was their testimony. You see, Jesus warned us that it would be that way. You see, everything's not going to be all rosy. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 35, says, Think not that I've come to send peace on the earth. I'm not come to send peace, but a sword. You know what the Word of God will do? The Word of God will bring some of us together. But the Word of God will also divide some of us. Amen. You know what sets me apart from the charismatics and all those other things over there, all those other religions and, and other things? It's the Word of God. Amen. That's what separates me. That's what sets me apart. Friend, but that's what brings... Me into fellowship with churches like you. 
It's the word of God. You see, but that word of God, it can either bring us into fellowship or it can divide. But that was a testimony of these men. But I, I want to give you the traits of these men. I'm done right here. The traits of these men. As I begin to look at these men and, and, and I begin to think, what was it about them, preacher, that caused them to turn the world upside down? What was it about them? And I know this was the Apostle Paul, and, and there is no apostles today unless you go to Uganda, and then every other church has their pastor as an apostle. And, and, and boy, I, by the way, I could, I could have a mega church right now in Uganda if I would just put apostle in front of my name. They told me that. That's what they said. They said, Pastor said, if you would just, if you would just tell people that you're a prophet or an apostle, they said, you could not have a big enough building. And I thought about it for just a minute, but, but amen. But, I, but you see, there is no apostles. Now, I understand that Paul was an apostle. There's things about him that was different. They had that touch on them. They had that anointing. They had that gift of healings. And, and I know a lot of folks are claiming to have that today. Oh, that's not there today. That's not there. I understand that. I still believe in a God that can heal. And I, I pray, and God can heal. And I've seen God heal. I've seen God do it. But I don't believe there's a man alive today that has the power to lay hands upon somebody. It ain't there. You can't find it. But we see the traits of these men. I want to know some things here. Let me give you just a couple things and I'm done. I've said it already. I do that to help your feelings. Amen. Because if I can tell you enough, you'll think, okay, he'll be done in just a minute. Amen. But we see their manner was consistent. Look at verse 2. It says, and Paul said, as his manner was. You see, their manner, you know what his manner was? They was faithful. Paul said, as three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them out of the scriptures. It was, it was consistent. He was faithful. And if you'll go over to the book of Thessalonians, you'll see that Paul, night and day, he was only there for one month, and Paul was able to found the church of Thessalonica. And in one month, he taught them all the major doctrines that there was in one month. You see, he, he was there. He was consistent. We see that his manner was consistent. They were faithful. Paul was faithful to the call that God had placed on his life. In Acts chapter 9, when Paul got saved, God told him then that he was going to be a light unto the Gentiles. In Acts chapter 13 then, Paul says, Separate me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work whereunto I have called them. You know what? From that very day forward, Paul was faithful to that work. Paul was faithful to that call. He was faithful to what God had placed on his heart to do. Yes, there was times he was locked in prison. Yes, there was times that he wasn't able to do what he wanted to do, friend, but he was faithful to that call that God had placed on his life. As I say here tonight, God has a call on my life, but it ain't just me. Friend, every one of us in here, God has called every one of us. You may not be a preacher, you may not be a Sunday school teacher, but you've got a call on your life. And I can sit here and go down through the Word of God tonight. If you're, if you're lost tonight, God has called you to salvation. Amen. God, is, God wants to save you tonight. He says you must be born again. There's a call of salvation. And every child of God has a call to separation in their life. Friend, we ought to come out from among this world and be ye separate, saith the Lord. There's a call on our life. There's a call to service, friend. Every one of us is to be a witness and a light in this world. We're called to be a living sacrifice and I could go on and on and on but I want to ask you this, are we faithful to the call that God has for us? There's not a one of us that God just called us just to sit on the pew and do nothing. Every one of us has a purpose and, and, a, and God has a plan for our life. Friend, are we doing that? Do we know what that is and are we faithful to do that? They was faithful to the call. Friend, they was faithful to the word of God. Never one time did Paul deviate from it. And you see, at the end of Paul's life, he could say in his last words, he could say, I have kept the faith. You know what that faith was? That was the body of truths. That doctrine that God had delivered to him, he said, I've kept it. I've not wavered from it. I've not wandered from it. I haven't compromised one, in, one inch of it. Friend, when I die, I want to be able to say the same thing, that I have kept the faith. I've not wavered. I've not wandered away. Friend, I want to be, I want to be faithful to God's word, friend. You see what we see? Are we faithful to that? He was faithful to witness. Everywhere Paul went, you look in Acts chapter 24, 25, where Paul was on trial. And usually when people are on trial, they plead their case for why they should be released. But you know what happened with Paul? Instead of that, Paul gave his testimony. He said, I count myself happy to answer before you this day. 
And he began to testify about how God saved him. This is another story for another time. But I always wondered, preacher, what would, what would happen if, uh, if, 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 if I ever got locked up, if I ever got locked up for preaching the gospel, what would I do? Would I be like the Apostle Paul? And when it happened, I wasn't. <laughs> I didn't do so well. I don't know if you remember that. I mentioned it to you when we was talking about that container. But we had a, that we was by a wreck. It wasn't us in a wreck. But we was just there. And because I was white, everybody recognized me. And so when this wreck happened, I went on, took Mama Debbie home, and, and, and they all called. And by the time I got back to the police department, it had been told that the Mazungu had run over these people and backed back over them and all this. And anyway, long story short, they locked me up that night. And, and you would think that, uh, boy, I, I wanted to be all this faith and I didn't have all that. All I did was complain and state my innocence. <laughs> well, that's another story for another time anyway. But, hey, we did pray our way out of that. You ask me about that, we'll tell you about it later. But, hey, but that's what Paul and him did. They, 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 they wasn't deterred. They was faithful to witness. Every opportunity Paul had, he was faithful to witness. He was faithful to pray. It was, Paul's, it was Paul that said, he said, pray without ceasing. In everything with prayer, supplication. You see, that was, he, he was faithful to pray. Are we faithful to this? We see, we, we see the, the manner that was consistent, but we see not only that, the message that was central in their life. You know what was first and foremost in Paul's ministry? It wasn't building buildings. It wasn't uh, having school ministries. It wasn't building schools. It wasn't uh, having medical clinics. It wasn't drilling wells. It wasn't any of those things. All those things that I mentioned, we do that. But that's not the, that's not the thrust of our ministry. You see, the, the thing that was central in their ministry and the things that is central in my ministry is the message. That's what needs to be first and foremost. Amen. You see, we can, we can dig a well. People can have clean water. But you know what will happen, preacher? They'll die one day. Yeah. They'll still go to the same devil's hell, and that water won't help them one bit then. Yeah. You can clothe people. You know what will happen? They'll die one day, and they'll leave those clothes behind. Yeah. You can pay their medical bills. You can help orphans. And we do all those things. But if that's all we do, they'll die one day, and they'll go to the devil's hell. Yeah. But if we get the gospel to them, and they believe, and they get born again, Saved by the grace of God, boy, they can stand and sing the same songs that we sung. And, and they may suffer in this life, and they may have some problems in this life like we all do. But, friends, at the end of this life, they got everything ahead of them. Yeah. You see, the message was central. You see, that, that's what needs to be. You, you know what the message was? It was the gospel. That's what needs to be central in our life, the fall of man, the, the forgiveness that Christ offered, the future that's prepared, the flawless sacrifice, the faithful life that we're to live after we get saved. That was their message. Friend, their message was central. Let me give you the last couple here. The master that was in control is what made them to be people that turned the world upside down. Verse 3, he kept mentioning Christ. He said that Christ must needs have suffered. And Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. You know what he's mentioning more than anything in that is Christ. You know why? Because that's who's in control. Friend, that's, that, that was their master. The Bible says you can't serve two masters. Too many times we're unable to do anything for God because we've got too many masters. Amen. You see, Christ needs to be the preeminent one in our life. He's to have the preeminence above all else, friend. You see, Paul, that's what Paul said. He said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but it's Christ that liveth in me the life which I now live. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What it was, it was all about Christ. Christ was in control. That's why Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, he said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of God, that you may prove was that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You see, he wants us to be a living sacrifice, to, to live our lives for him, friend, to let him be in control and, and to be in control of everything in our life. It was proven by their love for Christ. It was proven by their loyalty to Christ. It was proven, friend, by their looking for Christ. They was looking. Every time you saw Paul talking about the second coming, he was expecting it in his lifetime. Friend, we ought to live in such a way that we're looking for his return. 
You know why they was able to turn the world upside down? Because their master was in control of their life. The message was central. That was what was their ministry was about, was the message of the gospel. Friend, you see their manner was consistent. But turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I'm done right here. Honestly, I'm done. Their motivation that persuaded them. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You get there, say amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 9, Paul said, Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. There's coming a day when every one of us believers is going to stand before him. I believe there's two judgments for humankind. There's a great white throne of judgment. That's going to be for those who rejected Christ. They'll stand before him that day. There'll be no chance of redemption or salvation then. They'll be condemned for rejecting the Son of God. But for us believers, I believe there's a judgment seat of Christ that will take place during the, during the tribulation periods. This world's going through the great tribulation. The church will be raptured out and we'll go through the judgment seat. Paul's saying it right here. said, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that which he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Friend, on that day I will not be judged for any of my sins. My sins was judged on Calvary. Thank God for that. Thank God for Romans 8 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Thank God for that. But I will be judged that day for the motives. Why I did what I did. The Bible said we'll be judged for every idle word. We'll be judged for what we did with the gospel. We'll be judged for the truth. Do you know you'll give an answer, and I'll give an answer for this message tonight. You'll give an answer for every, every sermon that your pastor ever preached and every truth that was ever shared with you. What did you do with that truth? Friend, there'll be a judgment day. And that day we'll either receive rewards or suffer a loss that day. Paul said, look what Paul said in verse 11. says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. Paul knew something about the fear of the Lord. Thinking about the fear of the Lord and I'm done with this. I think about this, our, the Lord's considered our Heavenly Father, right? I think about my, I have to simplify it, preacher, where I can understand it. When I was growing up, you know who my daddy was? He was my hero. My daddy could do anything. He could fix anything, work on anything. I was 25 years old, and I had something tear up, I'd call daddy, and he'd have to walk me through it. Amen, that, that's the way it was. He was my hero to the day he died. I loved him. I wanted to be around him. I wanted to fellowship with him, and, and, and I loved him. I, was a, I remember as a young boy just being in awe of my dad. I thought, I thought he could do anything. That's the way we ought to be with the Lord. That fear of the Lord is an awe and respect. But you know, there'd be times where I got in trouble in school, and I hated to come home because I knew what was coming. You see, the same, the same daddy that I looked up to that I loved and, and, and I knew that he loved me, but I also knew that there was going to be some punishment, preacher, because I'd messed up. And in the Christian's life, I believe that's what the fear of the Lord is. It's an awe, and it's a respect, and it's a, it's a reverence for who God is. But if we have disobedience in our life, I still believe in the chastening of the Lord. Amen. There ought to be some of that. And I don't know exactly, but I believe Paul was human just like us. And there's probably some times that Paul looked back on and he said, boy, I could have done better. And he knew that there was coming a day when he was going to stand before the one whose eyes was as a flame of fire. And he was going to have to answer for him one day. Answer to him one day. God help us. I believe that was their motivation. And we know that we need to understand that there's going to be a time of review that we're going to have to Come before the Lord one day. He's going to review our life, what we did for him. There'll be a time of reckoning. There'll be a time of reward or loss. I don't know about you, but it's, I, I, I kind of, I'm excited about the coming of the Lord. And boy, when you look at the events that's taking place today, I believe it's closer than it's ever been. I believe it could be right now. I mean, it's almost like you could just hear the trumpet sound any moment from what's going on in this world today. 
But I'm excited about that. But at the same time, boy, to stand before the one who gave his life for me, who loved me, and have to stand and give an account before him one day. I'm not looking forward to that. I'm not looking forward to it. But that was their motivation. But let me ask you this. Tonight, as I'm closing and turning over to the preacher, what about us tonight? Can we say, what is our testimony? Can we say, does the world say about us, that, that's that bunch over there that just turns things upside down? Is that what the world says? That, that bunch over there, all they do is preach the gospel. All they do is try to get folks saved. All they do is try to get folks to get right with God. That ought to be our testimony. We ought to have, if we're going to have that type of testimony, we need to have these things, the same things in our life that they had in ours. Is our manner consistent tonight? Are we faithful? You know, the Bible requires faithfulness out of us. Moreover, it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Are we faithful to the house of God? Are we faithful to pray? Are we faithful to read? Are we faithful to witness? You see, if we're going to be able to turn this world upside down, there's going to have to be a manner that's consistent. You see, the message is going to have to be central in our life. It's got to be about that. It's got to be about the book. It's got to be about the gospel. You know, that was a command. He didn't tell us to build the biggest churches. He said, go in all the world and preach. That message needs to be central. I don't believe God's into mega churches. Boy, I, I'd love, our, our church over there is running about 120. I'd love to run about 200, 300. I'd love to, but you know what I'd rather do? I'd rather be able to start another church in another place where they don't have a church. I'd rather take some of those guys and say, hey, why don't we go down here? Where those folks, they, it's too far to walk to this church. Let's go build a church down there where they can, they have a place to hear the gospel. What about it today? That, the message ought to be central. Friend, you see, it, the master needs to be in control. If we're going to do anything for God, he's going to have to be in control. We're going to have to let him have his way in our life. You see, if I wanted my way, I, I never would have been in Uganda. I love it now. But if I'd had my way, I never would have went, preacher. I'd stayed right where I was, pastoring the church in the Grange, happy as I could be if I'd had my way. But I, had, I chose his way. And guess what? I'm happier now than I've ever been. And that's the way you'll find when you get in the middle of the will of God. I wish I could explain it. There ain't words to describe how sweet the peace is knowing you're in the middle of the will of God. But we're going to have to have the right motivation knowing that one day we're going to give an account of the task that he gave to the church. And you know who the church is? It's not just Brother Wayne. It's you that are born again. You make up the bride of Christ. That gospel and that commission goes to each one of us. What are we doing? Preacher, you come.